What's up, y'all? Um, welcome, everybody. This is Control Camp. We are a community built for and by independent artists. I'm one of your hosts, Raj, alongside me and my co-host, uh, Eric Campbell. Steph, she'll be with us here in a little bit, um, but we appreciate everyone being here. Uh, we host this room every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, where we like to interview industry guests, talk about how to get your music into TV and film. So, if you don't already know, get to know more about us over at controlcamp.com and all the resources that we have available. Um, and if you haven't already, be sure to tap the greenhouse at the top, follow our club. You'll get notified on every new room that we have. Uh, we'll be doing our campfire convo today, uh, where we'll be discussing news in the world of sync and answering your questions. So stick around. Uh, we'll be you know, pulling people up, give you a chance to chit chat about all the sync stuff, uh, get your questions answered. And uh, before we get started, go ahead and ping a few folk, spread the wealth, let them know, um, you know, we got a, a really, really great lineup of, of topics to talk through. Um, so if you feel like this would be beneficial to, to some folk, go ahead and ping them in the room. And also with the new Clubhouse chat feature, we might be in your DMs. We might be sliding your DMs. So uh, just check out and be on the lookout. Our, um, uh, one of our volunteers, Brian, he might be hitting you up. Uh, and we just want to know a little bit more about your experience here with Control Camp and um, what you like, what, what ideas you might have, what you'd like to hear more of. So be sure to check check your uh, the DMs and the chat feature on Clubhouse. And with that said, I think we can, we can get started here in a bit. Eric, what you thinking? No, let's roll and let's, let's get things uh, kicked in. So, um, yeah, so while we're getting started getting things uh, up, um, I'm, I'm, we're opening the, you know, we got a, the room is still just kind of filling up. So, uh, and we got a lot of family and regulars in here right now. So I've got a hand raising up. We can just do an open mic to start off. So feel free if you want to jump up, say, Hey, say a word, uh, share something with us. Uh, we'll, we're going to do an open mic for a little bit while we uh, get things kicking off. And we got Matthew and Shelly up here. What's going on, Matthew? Not much. It's been a bit of a intense week. Uh, yeah, I uh, there's this movie that I did the music for, this animated short that uh, is executive produced and written by Shaq. So that got announced in Dead or uh, in Variety, and they include me in the articles. So I've been getting lots of uh, messages. It's been kind of intense. But yeah, that's awesome, bro. Yeah, it's called that's... Head Noise. If anyone wants to check it out, what's um, it called? Head Noise. Head Noise. I think it comes later this year or next uh it actually will say in the, the article <laughs> what uh but, what's uh, it about uh, hmm. I, just wanted to, uh I don't know how much i can say <laughs> but it's a um it's a story inspired by certain aspects of shaq's career and that's i think all i should say okay on the internet for now <laughs> that's awesome man it's um, awesome for the placements awesome that you know just getting the mention in the trades like really really cool and you also got the um the how's the music supervision gig going oh it's going great well actually this other composing gig came up that is probably going to take over um so i'm not going to be able to do as much music supervision stuff very soon but i think it's all all good um but I'm just waiting to hear back on some stuff for this other gig. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know what? I, I've realized that uh, you got to just like keep your eye on like the biggest opportunity you have at any given time and just make sure to kill it with that. You know, um, I made that mistake early on where I was, you know, playing guitar, or, like producing artists who I thought were cool. But like if something else is paying a lot more money or something, you know, immediately, then you should put all your time and energy into that one thing. Uh, stay, you know, multi-talented and different fields or whatever, but but keep your eye on like, yeah, the biggest opportunity at any given time. I love that. I love that. Just talking about like, you know, being able and willing to pivot and being able to kind of you know, recognize what opportunity deserves um, the most yeah, attention at that moment. It's hard to do too, because you know. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that maybe, or I know that's good advice, actually, because the biggest paycheck isn't necessarily the the right thing to put all your money or, or all your time into, you know, but. Exactly um, right. But it, yeah, it, I guess it, the, it's yeah. a, I think it, I agree with this, it's like a discernment of um, 
because sometimes it's it's a bigger relationship sometimes it's a bigger opportunity sometimes it's a smaller thing for right now but it it you really believe in your heart that it'll be a it'll lead to a bigger thing so it's it's calculated risks and um strategies at at all times but um i think knowing kind of honing your instincts so that you can make that call consistently right. you know time after time i think is the difference between success and that yeah yeah you know it's that that's interesting but it's also i mean i like what you said there because you know um i mean like in my case you know i have a podcast that's doing pretty well and you know like that's probably the least important thing in my opinion to my career it's led to some great work opportunities um it's this thing called composer talk if anyone's curious but um yeah you know like overall if i had to like let one thing go immediately it would be that first and i mean that's just been like the excuse to stay you know up to date with some of my composer friends and you know get to ask them any question i kind of want that would feel weird in a social setting outside of being interviewed in a podcast so um, i love that it's on spotify it's called composer talk yeah and we actually just made it to the top 100 uh music podcasts for apple podcasts okay. uh, it's on spotify as well though too but you know again it's like i don't mind if it's gonna have to take a break for this composing thing right now um but yeah whatever you know just gotta i see keep, it i uh, just i just followed you on spotify i love that oh thank you yeah, you've been you work. You are you're you're a humble dude. You got you're like sixty episodes in. That's pretty dope. Yeah, there's there's some fun ones in there. Um, yeah, it's a it's a fun thing. I mean, I just started that during COVID. You'll see if you look at the posting dates. But yeah, you should ask everyone else how they're doing. <laughs> I don't want to take up all. No, it's good. well. You 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 up here a few times, but we don't actually we don't we don't talk to you that much. So I I appreciate taking the time just to kind of get into what you're doing. It's really really cool. What was the name of the park? Yeah, Josh, it's called uh, Composer Talk. And it's, um, yeah, it's just I talked to uh, composers. I guess recently, too, there have been a couple of music execs. Like I interviewed um, Russell Zeker, who's the head of music at Lionsgate. Uh, really interesting talk because I get to talk to him from the perspective of the composer and also ask questions about, like, you know, sync placements or whatever. But just him talking on his own without me even like asking that too many questions. Like you, you learn a lot about how like someone who's in the hiring position, will t like when they talk about music and talk about, you know, finding songs, you learn a lot about what it is they actually are looking for at a certain time. And that kind of insight is what I try to go for in the podcast. I don't like to just ask. So you, you place this Beatles song in this thing. Like, what was that like? You know, cause everyone likes to make it topical because these interviews are typically around awards consideration and Emmy, you know, like someone's nominated for an Emmy, so they pay a PR person to, you know, get them interviews and whatever. But mine was like kind of meant to just give an insight into who the person is. And it's dope. You've got some great, um, I mean, you've got some great composers and supervisors and some really big productions. Like it's, you, you've really been putting some time in. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm very lucky that like a lot of my friends in LA, um, I guess like New York as well, but like the first season I definitely like went, all out with like getting the biggest composers I knew. Um, and like starting off with my friend Ryan, who does the music for Rick and Morty. Um, like it was pretty easy after I, Ryan was like, sure, to just like get most other composers. Started. Right. Cause that's a bit, that's a big pull from the very jump. That's awesome. Yeah. And then the other thing with the podcast is you'll see that like the first season arguably has some of the biggest guests just like of a season, first 10 episodes. But then I, um, I also wanted to, you know, as a member of the Composer Diversity Collective, kind of like shine a spotlight on traditionally underrepresented voices in film and TV composition, songwriting and uh, music supervision. So over time, like after the first season, I tried to make it basically for like every like one straight uh, white guy to like get a underrepresented voice on the podcast. And it uh it's a bit of a challenge sometimes but it, it's pretty important to me and i realized having like a bigger guest and then follow it with you know someone who's on the come up and just help build their credibility too you know it's been really cool to see um some way interview and then like you know five months later like it's great to see them have like a netflix show that's in the top 10 so that's not that awesome, i help man. with that at all but, but it's know, still it's awesome like, no and just the mindset yeah. and having more and more people with that mindset of giving 
voice and exposure to people who are on the come up or underrepresented, I just think is so important. So kudos to you, man. Thank you for sharing all that. I love, um, I really love what we're doing in this new format where we're kind of more dynamic and more just kind of vibing off of what's in the room and, um, kind of seeing what conversations we've been finding stuff that we, we never would have found out in our prior, like, um, previously orchestrated mm. format. So thanks for sharing all that, Matt. It's really cool. Of course. Well, thanks for having me in the room. <laughs> yeah. Just you continue to hang out on stage if you can. Steph is here. What up, Steph? Hey, Hey, you guys, how was everybody doing today? What's up? What's up, Steph? We're good. We just, we just in here waiting for you. We would just, oh, yeah. we just no, know. <laughs> Let me stop. She... I have been doing, no exaggeration, 16-hour work days for the last two weeks. So um, I'm going to say a bunch of stupid stuff tonight. I'm just going to give everybody a warning. So um, Dr. Lisa messaged me at the end of the last, or in the middle of the last last week's session. She's like, I hope Steph is getting some rest. So I was like, well, I'll pass on to her that you said that because we oh, see that all the time. I'm... No, I'm not, no sleep till Brooklyn is really my, 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 my for me. That's very sweet. I, I'm in a very good mood. It's all really good work thing. I think if anybody has ever worked on a, a major motion picture before and you get into like the week or two before production or principal filming starts happening sometimes, especially when there's performance based stuff, you start to learn that everything changes really fast and you just have to kind of roll with it. And it's a, uh, I'll, I'll bring some of the topics up tonight as we kind of go through, but it's pretty wild. Awesome. Awesome. Um, all right. So we had opened up hand raising cause we were kind of off to a slow start and we just wanted to kind of hear from, um, people in the audience. I'm going to bring up one more and then I'm going to close hand raising temporarily. But, um, while we have it, we got Shelly on stage. How you doing Shelly? Hey, I'm great. I'm so happy to be here. It's been a while. Yeah. How have you been? Yeah. How have you been? I've been good. I was off the radar in Mexico. I don't know if you guys remember. I was <laughs> I was really optimistic that I would be like making these every week when I was in Mexico, but it turns out Mexico's a thing for a reason. So <laughs> <laughs> I tried to find you guys for a while, but I the, the time zones and everything confused me. So I'm back. I'm in Idaho now and got back to work, got all my metadata sorted. So I'm feeling spicy. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. We're glad to have you up here. Yeah. Thanks um, for being me. Yep. So we just, um, just for, who, if you walked into the room, we just did a, like a quick open mic just to say hey to some of the people uh, in the audience and give them a chance to come up and say hello, greet us while we were uh, kind of getting the room uh, filled up. So it was a good chance to meet some of our um, members. Um, Mac London. Did I say your name right? You sure did. Hey, Eric. How are you? I'm good. Do you guys have some feedback? It's echoing on my end. Are you okay there? I, I'm not hearing anybody else. Yeah, I think it's got. It, it might be because um, Eric records, so it might be a little echo sometimes. But okay. yeah, you're good though. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Steph, how's it going? Nice to see you on here. Um, I have a, just a quick question. Uh, so, I am a recording artist out of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I feel super isolated up here. I'm surrounded by country artists, which isn't a bad thing, but um, I just started my musical career about, I don't know, a year ago. Wrote an album uh, in about three months, produced it, and then um, started getting some attention from, you know, people in Clubhouse and generally the music industry and signed with a sync agency. And um, I'm, I'm feeling a bit like I need to reach out and... Now that I'm with the sync agency, I'm first of all, I'm obsessed with with music and the visual arts. I think they're just like, that's my that's my thing. And I didn't even know it. It was pretty cool to to realize that that's been my passion all along. And um, so I'm trying to find people, individuals, uh, creative talent to be able to write with for sync. And um, was recently told that it's it's much easier to sync a song if uh, the writers aren't with any publishing companies like they're not you know signed and and so those are my questions for for you today if you have um, a chance to answer them is just kind of like how would I get a chance to network with other songwriters if I'm way up north here and and what are the rules when it comes to syncing and and being you know signed to a publishing company for example or you know other things like that and I hope I'm making sense and that's yeah it. 
Yeah. Right. By the way, Max's music is dope too. I heard her in one of Tommy's rooms. Her music is awesome. So she's oh, thanks. There. Thanks, Daraj. We really appreciate that. I'm excited for it. Thanks. Mag, would you have any curiosity in making holiday music? <laughs> I would love to make holiday music. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So I signed a, uh, an admin deal last year and my publisher sends me like briefs for stuff here and there. But um, yeah, I would love to talk about, yeah, I'm like supposed to do some like Christmas slash holiday music for them in the next month or so. But um, and just my general thoughts on the matter of like networking. I mean, you're doing it just being here and <laughs> saying all that. But two, like I'm sure you can like record from home and you can write. I can and I've Zoom. got actors. Is to like world class studio here. That's where I was uh, recording my whole album. I have incredible Juno Award winning producers. So these things are all very accessible to me. It's just it's just the people, you know. Like I like I said, we've got some really great talent here in the country world. But then they all like like the Canadian geese. They all leave, and I'm I'm left here all alone. So I feel like in order for my career to progress, um, which I obviously want it to quickly, um, I would like to to you know collaborate and connect with with a whole bunch of people not necessarily from the states but just like in the sync world i'm right. so so excited about it so yeah. sure i think that um what you said a couple of things that are, are are dead on and one yeah it's difficult i think um if you're working with people who are already signed and published sometimes um uh um, not always but even steph has shared some examples where sometimes it's difficult to get um things worked out sometimes when somebody is published. Another thing, and I'm also taking this from Steph who said this before, um, is if you're already with a sync agent, then some of the best collaborators are the other artists at that sync agency or just other artists who are signed at other sync agencies in general. Most of them, the easiest ones are going to be the ones signed at yours because all you do have to say is, hey, I just signed with whoever it is. I uh, would love to work with you. I'd love to check out some of your stuff. Here's some of my stuff. And then boom, it's easy. And it's also a great way to get a relationship with new other agencies just by reaching out directly. Most of their artists are listed on their websites. Go to their website, see what, who are the artists that they're representing, listen to the music, see who you vibe with, and just hit them up. It's, 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 um, it's the easiest, most direct way to, one, get relationships going. It doesn't matter where you are. Actually, in most of those cases, your ability to do stuff from home is even, in my opinion, even more of an advantage than having access to the other studios because the other studios you got to pay for. It takes you longer to book time right. there. You yeah. got to work, make sure the engineer is getting your stems. If people know you can do a home setup, they're much more apt to work with you than yeah and i have that there. too like i have i have all of that in my basement so i have that and then i also have access to i mean calgary's pretty small in terms of like the music scene so the, the studios are booked up more now because of all the covid um art art that has been coming out from the pandemic people were busy writing but for the most most part it's been pretty good but that's yeah that's a great idea and with tommy Duraj, like he had mentioned that too is to connect with his writers so that's definitely something that i'll be doing as well so thanks for that thank you so i wanted to just touch base on this really quickly um you know to talk about in terms of difficulty it, eric had it right and i think one of the challenges is you don't necessarily even have to stick to your own sync rep if your sync rep is not exclusive. It does make it easier. I think the bigger thing is whoever you're working with, it's always easier in house is really the thing. So if you do have an exclusive deal, that's a whole thing. But if you try to go right with a writer that's signed to Sony or Universal or something else, your song becomes a uh, non one stop. You know, it means it has to have multiple signatures. It could still be easy, clear, but generally speaking, especially if you're writing with a major publisher, you're no longer an easy, clear sort of position anymore. And that's the thing you always want to be. So you, I don't want you to be discouraged from writing with other people in other camps or, you know, other things. I think what you want to look at is how easy is this person's sync rep or publisher to deal with. <laughs> and that is really has to be assessed on a, you know, case by case basis and conversations just need to be had because a newer artist even signed to Sony versus like a really well-known artist signed to Sony are two different things. I've worked with plenty of signed writers that we have, but you know, someone who's brand new, they bend the, they, they might bend the rules a little bit because they're trying to get them co-writes and they're tr in the same position that you are. They're trying to get them out in the universe. But if you look at their biggest writer and say, oh, hey, this person already has multi-platinum, blah, 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 tons of whatever. And then you try to, you know, 
co-write a song, they're going to try to extract as much money as that every time that song goes out, which by the way, is not always necessarily a bad thing. The more, the idea of it is the more people you work with, the more teams and the more people you have pitching those songs to. So yes, it could be a disadvantage, but it could also be a very strategic advantage. Me writing with some of my largest songwriting partners definitely put me in rooms with huge bands or huge acts that I would never have an opportunity to, you know, be with before. So don't get discouraged that way. And then in terms of you being Canadian, I would um, also encourage you really to talk to SoCan because they're, pardon my French, fucking awesome in terms of setting up co-rates. And I've, I've signed many, many artists that I've met at SoCan Mixers because my writing partner is also Canadian and my board member is also from Calgary, where you're from. So I've been very tapped into the Canadian community. I love them. SoCan is a massive resource. So go to their mixers, do their digital events. Um, and this is going to be a weird one. But talk to the Canadian um, embassy here in the States, too. They really like to set up Canadian artists with U.S. labels, publishers, supervisors, and so on and so forth. So I, I can't tell you why I know that, but that is 100% a thing. So check out your embassy, too, here. Find Frank Dukes. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to chime in. He's uh, one of my favorite writer producers. He's Canadian. I mean, he's prolific. If you don't know him, look him up. Frank Dukes. Frank Dukes. That is awesome. So, um, cool. Uh, all right, let's get through the. Um, let's say hey to the other two people we invited to the stage. Eric, how are you? Hey, I've uh, I've been I've been doing well. It's uh, it's good to see you all again here, and uh, you know it's always a pleasure coming here every week. Um, you know, I mean, uh, my past week has been uh, really really productive as far as you know, especially somebody new in this industry. And um, I was I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Sync Summit, but um, yeah, did you like, go? You participated yeah. in it yeah. uh, vir virtually, right? Yeah, it, it was virtual, but it was a really good experience nonetheless, because I mean, I didn't know anybody when I went in there. And then by the time I came out, like I had almost tons of connections. So it was, it was really awesome uh, to be able to pull, you know, a whole bunch of connections and also make the realization that a lot of this is a tight knit community, the sync community, the music supervision community is a tight knit community. And it's so awesome. And it's, you know, because everybody knows each other, and there's like this, there's this kind of, kind of, kind of bond, you know, and and some relationships are stronger than others, but it's just it's really cool to see that. Um, and I mean, other than that, I've just been, um, I, I did a small, very small podcast where I actually got to talk about music supervision and sync licensing and stuff. And on top of that, I was, uh, I've just been doing, um, you know, uh, reviewing songs to get ready for placement for my uh, for my job. So. Very cool, Eric. Well, thanks for telling us about um, all that and the Sync Summit. Um, I saw it. I didn't participate this year, but I did see it online. It was like a week or was it like three or four days, right? Yeah, it was uh, Tuesday through Friday. Yeah, so I saw was, a lot of speakers. So it looked like it was really it was a lot of people participating. I saw a lot of familiar names. Um, so it seemed like oh, yeah. a really oh, good yeah. time. A lot, of, a lot of people there. Very cool. All right. Thanks so much for sharing, Eric pleasure and um harsha is that how you pronounce your name oh yeah yes eric thank you how are you how are you doing i'm good sir i'm actually from india and i really enjoyed uh, what you guys were discussing here so um i just wanted to quickly ask um could i ask you a question sure sure is it about sync like like music for tv or film yeah so what i wanted to ask you about was when it comes to publishing um music um you know the 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 ownership of your royalties if if you were a songwriter and you wrote a song and the ownership of your royalties and the the publishing rights if you sold it to a publishing company or with a recording label um etc um how does uh how does that really uh play out differently in a major label as opposed to like an independent label and what would you say is the best way to go about that if you were um, a recording artist or, or a singer songwriter in today's 
landscape um, and also i just want to quickly say mac london um, i really liked the question you asked as well and um, i sort of uh, heard your music as well before and i'm a singer songwriter i would love to collaborate with you if that's okay and i'll dm you later thank you thank you eric no no worries this, um it sounds like what you're asking though is a more of a um correct me if i'm wrong but it sounds like it's more of a general question about um pub major label publishing versus um independent label publishing and that's not really i don't know that um we really have anyone on stage that can um accurately speak to that because we really focus more in this room on um licensing music specifically on a television show and an advertisement and the major label um versus indie label um agreement you might get a better better more tailored responses in the more of the indie rooms um so I don't okay know. um so i just maybe then uh, slightly shift the question so how would it work in the tv film and ad industry so the same kind of you know royalty or your music gets picked up how would that usually publishing or the rights or how much should you sort of how does that work um well, i'll answer this and then um we may come into the other way but i i will say and others can jump in if you are um placing your music with either let's say a music library or an agency every deal and we've talked about it in this room every deal is totally different and so these are different than like a publishing deal um per se normally whoever is representing your music um is agreeing to sign represent or license that music um potentially for just a portion of you know they might um if they're representing it they might get a percentage of the master or they might get a percentage of the copyright that could be the publisher side or the or usually not the writer side but um, there, there's not a standard in our industry, un, unlike maybe more of like indie or major labels. A lot of those deals are case by case basis. It's based on um, the magnitude of the person who's or business that's shopping the music, the deals that they make, what types of deals that they get. So that does vary a lot. But um, uh, usually you're not signing away the rights to all of your songs. You're usually you're assigning your rights to an individual song. And so within sync, you can have, usually you can have um, multiple partners um, that are associated with multiple items in your catalog. Different from a publishing, which sometimes it's usually all or nothing uh, with a publishing company. Hope that, hope that helps uh, a little bit. All right, so um, 8.30, this is Control Camp, uh, CTRL Camp. If you want more information about us, you can go to uh, controlcamp.com. Make sure you uh, click on the icon above my picture that looks like a house and follow the camp. That's how you get access to the awesome after party that we do that starts in 90 minutes. And um, uh, yeah, we usually are here. We're here every week discussing um, issues related to sync licensing. And so we're going to start, um, we're going to continue. Um, we have Mike and Amanda. And uh, uh, Clint just joined the stage, but let me just have Mike and Amanda were here. We're gonna we we did this before, but we're gonna pick two people and ask this question. We want to uh, sincerely know that you're all you're both human beings. We want the room to see us as not just execs and supervisors. So um, we ask this in all sincerity. Mike, how are you doing today? Like, how are you actually doing? How are you feeling? Doing good. Thanks, Eric, Daraj, Steph. Thanks for having me up. Um, yeah, all is well. Busy, but busy is good these days um, in these most uncertain of times. So, yeah, feeling good, feeling healthy, no complaints. Like Thank you for that. asking. And yeah, hope the same for all you guys. Thank you so much. Amanda, how are you feeling today? How are you doing? Oh, Amanda, are you there? She might have stepped away. Oh, maybe she stepped away. All right, Clint, same question. How are you today? How are you doing? How are you feeling? Hey, hey, hey guys. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. Yesterday, I had some quesadillas, and 
they were good, but they had black beans on them, and my stomach's hurting <laughs> right now. So, <laughs> all, the all the way real. I, I love that. I'm for it. Indeed. I love that story but, set up because I was like, you, you, you had me paying attention. I was like, wait a minute, where's it going? Where's this going? <laughs> Hey, he, yeah. about to, he, he about to have a whole different kind of sound pack. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Keep it yeah, classy. Other than, that, other than that, I'm good. Just just really social distancing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like I want to be socially distanced from you right now. <laughs> yeah. That is funny. Well, I'm glad you're here, bro. And, uh, I totally understand if you need to drop off and come back on. We'll hold that against you. <laughs> cool. Appreciate it. <laughs> but we might call you out for it. <laughs> How you doing, Amanda? Uh good. How are you guys? Very very good. Good to see Our, you. You know, humanizing moment of how are you doing? Gen genuinely asking how your day is going today. Uh, just dealing with some licensing stuff that's been on my desk for a little while. <laughs> But otherwise, uh, yeah, everything's good. Wait, can I pick on Amanda for a second out of curiosity? Since Eric set off a whole thing last week with, um, I think it was Mike, uh, or maybe the week before, where we ask a couple of personal questions. Because we haven't had you on as a guest, Amanda. We've had you on our stage as a moderator many times, but never on, you know, on feature. Can you take us through, like, what a typical day might look like for you? Like what kind of stuff you work on? You don't have to give us any details, of course. I mean, just generally speaking. Yeah, sure. Um, we're kind of, so my mentor often says we're meatball lawyers. <laughs> wait, well, wait, what? Meatball lawyers? So yeah, just... like we do all of the, di like the, there's so much different stuff that goes into what we do. It's like a meatball. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Um, so my days are always different. Um, I try to keep structure to keep my sanity. Um, but basically I try to get, you know, emails done in the morning and then I'm working on, uh, any given day, music licensing requests and review of licenses, uh, drafting documents that could be anything from like a purchase and sale agreement of uh, copyrights or income streams, which is a very hot but hot topic right now, um, to producer agreements. I just got a site artist agreement request. Um, I uh, a lot of phone calls throughout the day usually. Um, entertainment law a lot of it is just talking to people <laughs> um and then really the uh the majority of my like real work gets done in the evening when the phone calls stop and i get to sit down and just be alone and focus um so it's really i'm really not ending my day most days until at least 9 or 10 p.m if not later that's that's fascinating to hear actually we don't have to get into it now but I, I think for the purposes of our room you know just something to remind yourself as song creators writers producers all the things uh, Amanda was talking about you know, the sale of catalog and your your income streams and things like that you know beyond just your sync catalog that you're creating you know when songs don't go for sync or even if they do Eventually down the line, they also have a second life in terms of catalog and, you know, you can get royalties or you could also get um, advances against them. And if they are synced and they have done well, it makes them more valuable, creates more pipeline for them. So, you know, we don't talk about those kind of things a lot in here, but there's income beyond, you know, just what you're creating for the moment for that sync at that time, you know, which at some point we should... Uh, kind well, of extrapolate on. Yeah, Something. I actually want to, um, this is a good time to ask this question because I, I was having this discussion with another um, executive early in the week. And so with all of you here, um, um, with all of you here, I'm wondering, so you have all have been noticing how like we're in this wave of like catalogs being sold um, outright. And it seems like, I mean, to my, in my opinion, it seems like it's a, 
it's it's um, it's like a big it's bigger thing now than even in the past like entire catalogs from major artists and major producers and writers just being catalog you know bought out and that you also have more companies now that are even offering um there was there was royalty exchange now there's some other companies that even offering independent composers if they've got sync placements or other royalties to um sell out either sell out their catalog i've seen two deals types of deals this week i've seen one where you sell out your copyright um kind of um either at like an auction and then the other where you're kind of getting a financing company that's like advancing you money based on your um um on your copyrights and and the income that they bring in but um anyone have thoughts just in terms of you know um this trend and whether like I'm actually l more concerned about it because it just seems like a lot of people are just you know selling their entire catalog like out wholesale. It seems I mean for lots of money, but it seems like a a big thing now. Any any thoughts on that? Um, I think you're right in that it's happening a lot, but it's actually been happening a lot for a very long time. I think there's a couple of things that have shifted, and one is what's new is uh, up until I would say I don't know two years ago maybe it was totally uncouth to consider selling your writer's share uh portion of your song not your publishing but your actual writer share which there are now companies that advance against that there are new trends in the industry recognizing that it's very difficult if you've ever worked in this business you know most big companies, if you're working for a studio, are on a net 45 or net 90 day kind of pay, which means you get paid well after you do the work for it, which is really hard to sustain if you don't take a publishing deal, which are, you know, sometimes like bad bank loans for that reason. Um, that's kind of what they're, they're built on. The fact that you're, you know, making someone's trying to make sure that you have money so you can do what you do. So you're not having to have a day job and you can focus on making music because it takes so long to get paid. Uh, and even after those net 90, if you're going through other intermediaries or other companies, they could have 30, 60, 90. So it can be six months before you get paid for the thing that you do. And that's if your company's on top of their shit and they PO you and they, you know, do all the things that they need to do. So a lot of those deals also come from that. Um, one trend that's happening now is because of what happened to the economy in not only 2008, but again in 2020, um, there's a financial term called TINA which is there is no alternative in terms of investments. So a lot of people who are not in the music game um, are getting into the music game financially because they see it as an asset. That's what copyrights are, they're assets. So you should also think about them. But Quincy always said, music is like, songs are like real estate, <laughs> you know, treat it like each one you have is a house that you're you know, building, which I thought was really genius. He made a really good point to me once he said, you know, I wrote, um, uh, what's oh, now the name's escaping me. It's basically a song that he wrote and it became the Austin Powers theme. And he's like, I wrote this 30 years ago and then suddenly it's in this movie and I wasn't, oh, Soul Bossa Nova. He wrote Soul, Soul Bossa Nova, you know, decades before it happened, but then, you know, Austin Powers happened and it had a whole new life for him and made him, you know, a fortune. So you have to really think about it as real estate, you know, <laughs> like something that you hold on to as an asset long term so there are a lot of people who are non-musical people i've been approached many times recently by people who have no business in music trying to acquire catalogs or invest in our company it's a real thing i say instead of scaring anybody it excites me because since people have to put their money somewhere why not invest in us why not invest in music if you can you have to be very very cautious about those kind of investors and the people that you get into business to and be realistic about if you're one artist, you're actually not always the best investment. Uh, and some people who want to invest in you, you have to ask why they're doing that. If they're an angel investor, which means they love you. If someone offers you money like that or offers to buy a catalog, do they have the money to really afford it? You know, there's a lot of things that go into those things. But in terms of large sale acquisitions and stuff like that, I don't think they're happening much more than anything else. I just think that they've done so well for so many people for so long that there's now just a marketplace that's trading it a little bit higher. And because of that, you've got these more high profile artists in the news, like Bob Dylan and things like that. You know, other people are taking notice sort of a thing. So I, you know, and, and by the way, there's a trend with, you know, the same kind of 
less musically sophisticated investors, but high finance guys getting into Broadway as well. And this is going to sound very fucked up, but it's a hundred percent true. If you know anything about finance, some of them get it into it because they're like, Oh, I need the loss. So even if you don't make them a bunch of money, if they're very rich, the loss is almost as valuable as the gain because they're offsetting for taxes. So I think for all those reasons, those are trends that are happening. And I don't know, not too scary to me. It's incredibly insightful, though. I love that take on it. It's really, really got my head spinning. Like just thinking. Really cool. Uh, we've got Atik on the stage. Now, how are you doing, Atik? I'm doing well. How's everybody doing tonight? Doing good. Good to see you. Good to see you on the stage. Good to see you, yeah. And also, Chris from Push Audio is here. How are you doing, Chris? Doing great, Egg. It's great to be back. Oh, it's good to have you. Good to have you. Um, so, all right. Um, we're going topic to topic. Um, it's actually a slow news day today, which is why I'm talking about some different things. But, Steph, you said something that um, I don't know how much you can talk about if we can come back to this now. But when you, when you first came on, you were talking about that you're in this phase now for the show or movie where things are about to go into production and that's a whole different thing. But what can you share, especially since this started as a pitch, you know, hey, can you do a song? Like how much of this process can you share of how we got from, you know, pitching, how you got from pitching a, a song or a group of songs for an opportunity to, you know, preparing for production and shooting and what that looks like. How much of this can you talk about? <laughs> so you, so Eric knows the whole story because Eric was on the pitch with me and knows that from pitch to now it was, I got the first call. The It had to be like 4th of July weekend, like right before, I guess, July 2nd was the first time I had heard about this. And now it's, you know, July 28th. So this accelerated incredibly fast. Um, it doesn't always accelerate this fast. The movie that I'm on now accelerated quickly because uh, COVID. So they had had started, and and it's not uncommon. And you know, I won't speak to this movie, but I'll speak in general terms. Where, you know, all sorts of things happen with movies, especially when COVID's involved. But even when COVID's not involved, sometimes you get a script, and then they rewrite it. So it gets fired. Hired sometimes or replaced. Um, sometimes they drop out. Sometimes you get a writer and that person drops out. So you can start on things and, you know, things get shifted. But what sometimes, especially with COVID is happening, and it's happening on a lot of productions that I'm on, it's happening the TV show we worked on too. We'll start talking about something months in advance, like the TV show I'm working on. I got the call back in March or April for it. Uh, and it actually doesn't come out until you know, uh, it's animated. So it'll come out in the fall of 2022. So sometimes you get a really long lead time and sometimes you get a really short one. What I noticed with COVID though, is that the particular production I'm on, they had, this had a very long lead time, but because they couldn't do a lot of the things that they wanted to do because of COVID protocols, they're starting very late, but they decided to keep the same production schedule. So they just lost like eight months basically. And instead of trying to like push out the movie another year because there's all sorts of marketing and principal talent and things that get attached to it. It's like, okay, well, if I get, you know, Will Smith to be in my movie, he can only shoot it, you know, May to June or whatever of 2021. And, you know, if we have to move the movie, he's shooting another movie next year. So a lot of things like that happen. So they chose to keep the schedule for whatever reasons they did on this one. So we just work on a very accelerated timeline <laughs> and, um, I think when we started this one, they knew that they had these big production numbers. And I went out to our team and Eric and Daraj pitched on one of them with us. And the music supervisor called me and said, okay, you won the biggest song, which is the big production number in the film. It's, it actually plays four times in the movie. It's a big, big number. And that in and of itself was a big job. But then they said, oh, <laughs> Principal shooting starts August 8th, choreography starts next week. You know, we need to make a bunch of adjustments to this song so that these choreographers know how to, you know, at least block it out. And look, sometimes it's as simple as talking it through with the choreographer production team, which we did. I talk dance because I had a dance Broadway mentor when I grew up. 
So I sat with the you know production team and the choreographers. We talked about you know the counts, and then we say, okay, the tap dance solo happens for these eight breaks, or the banjo solo happens for these you know this count, and then we will actually just use a click track to mark out that time. Um, but we're a bunch of overachievers, and I really wanted to get them a bunch of music. So we said, all right, well, let's just see if we can plow on some of this music <laughs> and we did it and that was our only intention of working on this movie or what we thought and i guess we did just good enough of a job where the music supervisor said hey there's three other songs by three other artists we like how you produce this one would you put your hands on these other three and i said okay cool it'd be really fun to do and then they go oh yeah but we also need those done yesterday so you know we've been um <laughs> playing catch up um, and every song is different, but I think, you know, something we never really talk about in this room is that there's actually a tremendous amount of work in the space that I'm working in now um, in terms of making bespoke music for original numbers for performance scenes or big, you know, musicals. And especially because remember we talked about it a couple weeks ago where we said musicals are making a big comeback and somebody has to make those, write those songs and produce those songs. Um, so that's a huge, you know, chunk of the business on the sync side that I think only a few people get to do. Um, you know, I was out competing with the top 10, I would say, guys who usually, you know, do this and they're all prolific. And I say guys because it's mostly guys. So there's very few women. There's a handful of really good ones, but not a ton of really great um, women who get to do this stuff. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be trying my hand at it as much as I, I can. I feel very fortunate, but again, it's a no sleep thing. <laughs> so, you know, um, I would love, you know, at a certain point, I don't want to dominate the whole conversation with this, but like, I would love to get into what it's like, you know, to kind of work with production teams and do that kind of stuff. Cause it's a very different beast than make a song that's going to be played in the background somewhere. There are so many details that go into the specifics of, hey, if there's a trumpet on camera and that trumpet player is playing, sound needs to be coming out of that. And Eric, you actually did Greenleaf like this. Do you want to, I would love for you to talk about some of your kind of on camera, because Eric's actually also been on camera being a player on stage, which is a whole other sync thing. So I, I want to toss it right back to you <laughs> to, to talk about your experience on Greenleaf like that. Yeah, I, um, the production side is really interesting because um... I've gotten to do a couple of different things. Um, Greenleaf, so with on Greenleaf on the second season, I was part of the music production team. And a uh, small team, but we, so the show is a gospel-based drama. So a lot of gospel music. It's um, based in uh, the main actors, main characters are a church family, um, but a very dramatic church family. And so uh, there would be like Sunday uh, morning services and so they would always be like choir and so we would have charged with um creating the music for um you know the sunday services um they would do a lot of covers um occasionally original songs and then some of the characters were also aspiring recording artists in the show um deborah joy winans of the winans family was one of them and um so we had to create some original music for their characters and some of those were live performances um, where uh, they were, you know, they're singing in church or they're at a club um, performing. So it's actually really cool seeing some different ways, like one, just just creating the music, you know, and it's, I guess different scenes are different, but in that environment, one, uh, th things are very secure. So you're getting scripts at the last minute and scripts are subject to change. So you might get a script on a Tuesday for something that's scheduled to shoot on Thursday. Um, although Wednesday night, there might be a script change, which includes a music change or a song change. And so it's a very dynamic um, kind of, you know, just not being comfortable and being kind of on the edge of your seat, knowing that things could change and being, you gotta really be able to pivot and not take any, you know, things personally. Um, but yeah, we did, uh, it was actually a lot of cool things because, um, Getting to, if you write a song that's for a particular actor, you'll demo that song like you do any other song. 
and then the actor will come into the studio and you know we'll vocally vocal produce them get them to sing the song and then depending on the scene there they can either be on stage and they'll lip sync along with a demo that they recorded um sometimes the producer might the director might opt to um have them sing it live which i think editors hate and is usually always like the, the hardest hardest thing to to make actually work in the end but sometimes just depending on the song the actor might prefer it or the director might prefer it um and so we've we did both we've done both of those uh situations recording demos up front having the actor lip sync it on stage and then also having um because of the last minute nature of the changes actually okay. have i think we lost it oh did i black out did i can you hear me yep there you are we got you now yeah so um yeah because of the dynamic nature sometimes you do covers and then the i mean you do the demo and the actor will sing but then because of the last minute thing we also get into crazy situations where as they're doing a live recording and the, the um the actor might be singing it live um but it's different than what other recorders so we're actually doing the re coming into the studio singing after the fact recording after the fact and trying to match what they did on stage live which is just the it's a, it's just the biggest pain for us as well as for the editors um because um, then the editors might send it back to us to redo um but it's it actually surprised me um and it, different productions are different but it surprised me how with and um steph um you might have um, be interesting to hear your take but it surprised me how with different production companies and i've worked with a few different ones on different shows some things you kind of expect everything to be like in order you know you, these are these huge productions we all just go to movies and we see the, all these credits and so it seemed like a very it's a huge project management you know gig but sometimes some things feel really, really last minute. They're just scrambling to get things in order. A script just changed or an actor's not available or something's crazy on set. And so the amount of, of things, like pulling things out of the sky to try to get stuff to work, I think I was surprised um, by that. Do you see that a lot, Steph? Is that, do you feel like that's more the norm or the exception? Uh, it depends. Um, it depends upon the production. I mean, I've worked on productions that are massive that are so organized and there's so much project management because there's multiple, especially what we call co-productions. So, you know, if you have two studios working together, they're very diligent about their schedules and they're very diligent about their follow-ups and their email chains and everything is a new, uh, very well orchestrated uh, sort of thing. Uh, and it's kind of like a ballet, which is like, you know, because if somebody kind of drops, you're gonna get kicked in the face and it's gonna be a problem. <laughs> um, especially when there's multiple layers of approval. So the larger the movie or the larger the TV show, especially if there's double studios, there are multiple layers of approval. You have to have a real person just give you notes to give you notes. Oh, you might be dropping in and out a little bit, Steph. Um, did, unless you just stopped. Is it me, Daraj, or did she stop? Did she drop out? Uh, Daraj, Steph, can either of you hear me? Hello? Can anybody hear anybody? Anybody on the stage? Somebody say something. Using my phone. had an experience where we were approved all the way across the board on a theme we were doing for a television show. And then it turns out one team forgot to send it to the most important team for notes. And we got a really interesting note about energy back after everybody had approved the song. And we were kind of like, oh, we don't, we can write you a different song. <laughs> it's just like a different vibe. Uh, we ended up actually bumping it up a couple BPM and that did the trick. And it, it was, to be honest, it was kind of one of those notes that just shouldn't have existed. And I got the feeling that, you know, because somebody didn't get their chance of giving notes, they were trying to create 
an opportunity to make notes, which is something that happens. But I think that's exactly why you have to just have, like you said, have a thick skin and roll with the punches and kind of, you know, go with it. But, you know, on the flip side, I've worked on major studio indie films that are incredibly organized and major studio films that are chaos. So it really depends upon the producers, the production team, your line producers are actually everything, you know, but I would say the best advice I can say is be nice to everybody and be as easy as you possibly can. I find that it's super fun to be on the music team. Um, it's less fun to be the music supervisor sometimes because as mine was just saying, I'll deal with all the people you get to make the music. <laughs> so we're kind of like Santa Claus. We get to like make everybody happy and fix problems. And if they don't like something, we solve them. We make a new song and everyone's like, we're dancing, we love you. And then my poor supervisor's like, everyone hates me because nobody wants to play nice about splits. And you know, he's like the bearer of bad news and has to ask everybody to give up a piece of something or take less money or try to make a budget work and then try to explain to producers why they need more money or advocate for everybody who's working on it. So I, again, always have so much love for our music supervisors and, and I, I always say they are the most underappreciated and um, overworked, underpaid humans that I know in this entire business. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Um, Daraj, good time for a reset? It's time for a reset. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to Control Camp. This is a community built for and by independent artists. I'm one of your hosts, Daraj. Alongside me are my amazing uh, co-host, Eric Campbell, Steph Fink. We appreciate everyone for being here. We host rooms every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, where we like to talk with industry guests and uh, just get into how you can get your music into TV and film. So get to know more about us and all the resources we have available over at controlcamp.com. Um, and if you haven't already, be sure to tap the greenhouse at the top, follow our club. You'll get notified on every new room that we host. Also, uh, after tonight's room, uh, we'll be ending in about an hour. We do our after party. And so you'll only see that room if you are a member of our club. So be sure to follow us and you'll see that pop up in your hallway uh, right after this room closes. Uh, so we're doing our weekly uh, camp conversations. Uh, camp convos will be discussing just news in the world of sync, answering any questions you might have. Um, so stick around. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to ping a few people in the room, share the wealth. There's a lot of good information that's going around, especially for those who are looking to get um, into the space and know a little bit more about um, sync licensing uh, and getting your music in for TV and film and other visual media. Uh, and with that said, I'm going to kick it back over to you, Eric. I think we might be getting close to opening up and um, getting a little bit of the audience uh, interaction. But I'll let you take it over, Eric. Yeah, actually, I'll pass to Steph. Um, and then we'll get some, get some people jumping in. Booyah. I got you. I got you. Well, first, let me say, hey, Tommy. Hey, Jess. So nice to see you guys. Welcome back to the stage. Tommy, I feel like you've been in... Every time I, I really don't do rooms outside of control camp. I really I'm not on Clubhouse much, but I'll sign in just to see what everybody's up to. And it seems that no matter what time of day, be it 7 a.m. for me or three in the afternoon, Tommy is always crushing it on Clubhouse with a billion people. The like, Clubhouse you know. king. That's right. Animal. <laughs> Guys, yep. animal. Tommy, Yesterday Tommy was did, crazy. Yeah. We actually had somebody and I said, hey, I just feel somebody in the room needs somebody to tell them that they're okay, that their life is worth it. I think somebody in the room is thinking about taking their life and the dude spoke up and we spent an hour and it was amazing healing him. It was crazy. I have to say, I think that's the magic of Clubhouse to create a community where there is none and give people who might be feeling alone uh, you know, a sense of camaraderie and community that they might not otherwise get. So I applaud you for doing that. Atik, you're the master of that. We didn't say hello to you yet either. Uh, you know, uh, um, Atik, you, you have the room. How are you doing? You know, so I think Atik is the one who turned us on to that, as we've said before. Um, Atik, I have a question for you. I know it's not, you know, football season Shoot. just yet. What is your, I'm going to give you the, what's your day-to-day -day kind of happenings like now 
Uh, so it's actually kind of crazy. Um, we have our reporting deadline, which is important uh, for uh, writers and composers to get paid at the end of August. We're moving to Inglewood. Um, so we've got that going on. And then we've got Inside Training Camp, which is our training camp shows. And then working on a project for kickoff of the season with a big kickoff of our new facilities. Um, the commissioner's project that I was working on. Uh, and then I'm, I've got my other stuff like, um, I'm on the culture committee. So trying to improve the culture here. So I've got, I'm, I'm planning some events and stuff for, for all of our employees. So it's, it's been kind of stressful and, um, and I've also managed the schedules for all of our team for COVID. So between that and everything else, it just, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's so busy. Like, I feel like I need an assistant right now. <laughs> uh, I can't believe you don't have one. Yeah. Might it's, I it's nuts. ask you since you brought it up, um, if you're willing to, I don't know that everybody in the room understands uh, what a culture committee is or why it's important. I'm curious if you'd be willing to, you know, kind of share a little bit more about your work with that. Yeah. Um, basically it's trying to improve the culture of, of our LA office. Um, it just try to boost morale and um, essentially that's what it is, you know, try to build a community and feel like you're part of a team. That's, uh, that's basically the purpose of this group. Um, and just some of the, you know, some of the things over the years that came out, they, they realized that they needed this committee here. So um, we've established it and we host a bunch of events. We're doing a couple, we're doing stadium tours and planning a couple of stadium tours right now. We're also doing a farewell to our offices here and then also planning like happy hours at work and just various events, um, working with the Inglewood community as well. So just really trying to boost morale because it's been, you know, we had a month and a half ago, no, about a month ago, we, you know, we laid off a few, a number of people and so morale is down and, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff, return to work and mandatory return to work. So stuff like that. That's rough. I, I, I think it's amazing that you're doing that. And I think there's a good lesson in there for our room, which is, you know, like Tommy was saying, like Atik is pointing to, you know, watch that mental health, create communities, do what you can to boost morale, surround yourself with great people. And, you know, it's not just all about the music. It is all about being a good human, which makes better music. So thank you for that. Uh, I think we're going to kick it to some audience questions, but Diraj has one from the audience. And I just want to remind you that if you want to ask a question and you don't want to come up, you can back channel with Diraj and send him your question. And I think you got one in the hopper, right, Diraj? Well, no, I just have a question for the audience. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, and before I forget, um, when we were talking about Greenleaf earlier, my wife was in here listening and she on she was on her phone. As soon as Greenleaf got mentioned, she perked up. She was like, Eric was on Greenleaf. So you just got like immediate clout in the Wells household, Eric. I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> she loved Greenleaf. That's dope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the question I have for the audience, uh, I wanted to poll, I wanted to see everybody raise their hand if um if you have ever um, actually pitched your music before to maybe a, a licensing agent or a music supervisor or a music editor or uh, ha have you ever pitched your music for TV and film opportunities? Raise your hand if you have. I want to see what the audience is looking like. Okay, we got, I see six, eight, nine, twelve. Okay, so we got a good number. All right, all right, go ahead, put your hands down, put your hands down, put your hands down. Okay, second question. Raise your hand if you have never pitched your music before. Oh, wait, oh, Henry's got turned off. <laughs> Hold on, we're going to open it back up. I got it. I was controlling it. Yeah, I just opened it back up. All right, cool. All right. If you have never pitched your music before for TV and film opportunities, raise your hand. Okay, we got a couple. There. Okay, so we got a we got a, a a strong audience of those who have pitched before. So I wanted to ask a question because I was I was reading um, the Thinking and Sync book by Amanda Craig Thomas. I, I, it got recommended a while back and then got recommended again, and so I wanted to um, take a take a um, 
a shot at reading. I got like halfway through it in a couple of hours. It's not a, a long read, but she has some really, really good information about how to. Yeah, like it confirms a lot of what we talk about here often. Um, but I, I was just curious and I don't know where we want to take, um, you know, questions or if we're ready for that yet, Eric, but I would love to just kind of know from the audience, from those who have fished their music, even from those, <clears throat> well, from those who have kind of what they found, uh, what their experience has been like, what's been helpful for them or, you know, any challenges they may have had. And then for those who haven't pitched their music before, you know, maybe what questions they might have to encourage them to pitch their music. So I think that's great. Yeah, if you if anybody who's done any own, their own pitching directly to a soup or, or to an agency or uh, is that what you meant to write to? Not yeah, to I can frame it. So if or, you have pitched your music before to like a supervisor or agent, go ahead, raise your hand. I want to get some conversation and just see what's worked for you. You know, what was that experience like? And so I see we got we got a couple brave souls. Oh, we got a, a few. All right, let's let's throw throw a couple up here. Let's see. Okay, cool. I see Mac. Mac, what's going on? So hey. you've you've raised your hand, so I'm assuming you have pitched your music before, correct? I have, yeah. There's something called Canada's Drag Race up in Canada. It's a show, um, drag queens, that sort of thing. And uh, we're actually, my team is friends with the production team, and so we were able to, to just channel that relationship and pass them the song. And they're in uh, the pre-production stages, so we won't know, but uh, they've got the song. So that's been my one and only experience. I mean, we've sent emails and tried to make relationships with mu music supervisors, but what I'm finding is that's pretty hard to do. So you'd have to really work on those relationships on the back end before you even pitch a song. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to get blacklisted, which I don't want to do. So that's been my experience. <laughs> okay, so it's really Hello, so Mac. This is your first time pitching, you said um directly and you've been trying to build some relationships on the back end is that what i heard that's correct yeah so we have some producers that we're friends with um in terms of like shows that are currently in production or in pre-pro and just trying to get our foot in the door that way um but other than that trying to build some relationships with music supervisors but that's uh that's been that's been it i'm like i said i'm fairly new to this so just uh learning as i go here Mac, you're new, but you're crushing it. I think you nailed a really important element, which is, you know, work those relationships, kids. <laughs> you know, um, if you have them and you know that you have friends that are music editors, directors, producers, if you happen to have those people, be polite, be a human, ask, you know, I heard you're working on this. Would you mind if I send you stuff? Do you need, and more importantly, do you need anything? Is there anything I can do for you? That's the best thing. And a lot of directors and producers I work with are really appreciative in that respect. And a lot of them will pass you along to their music supervisors. They go, well, I don't really know, but we have a really cool music supervisor that works on this. Let me ask. And some of them will also take your music and annoy their music supervisors with it. So it works both ways, but I highly encourage it. Love that. Would, yeah, I would just even suggest preemptively asking to meet this music supervisor through them just to get them in the loop as soon as possible um, amen I, I actually had to just go through this i have a friend personal friend that's been an actor for years but landed a lead role on an on a network show and the supervisor was one that i hadn't really connected with before and so you know got the intro um was definitely he was like do you want me to just take it to the director producers i was like no can you intro me to the supervisor i'd much rather you know loop her in from the jump and yeah it's worked out to be and she, you know she was appreciative so i would just say try and get the supervisor looped in as soon as possible and not go around them so to speak amazing awesome all right, um, and I, 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 I'm Eric. I know you uh, sent a text. You wanted to follow up with your challenge from last week. I like that. Uh, let me know how you want to do that because I know this was kind of on the fly. So if you want to, okay, lit. Uh, Dana, I see you up here. So which category do you fall in? Have you pitched your music before, Dana? I'm pretty sure you have. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, here I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I have. I've pitched more than, you know, than, uh, than have had things stick. But I've had some things stick and I, and I, and I pitched, um, I actually just pitched something last week um, for a show and um, just over the years. Yeah. Did I answer a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. And I'm just curious. I like to catch, kind of know where people are in kind of this space because, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, how to get in front of the right people, how to engage, you know, how to, um, you know, have good etiquette. And so I'm just curious who's, who's actually pitching and just kind of what experiences they've had. Have it been good? Have it, you know, have they landed, you know, something for you? Have you, you know, gained some, you know, noteworthy relationships from it? Yeah. Well, um, I will in the, earlier stages i i was an art director in advertising so um like that way i tried to like take the back door a lot you know but it, it's kind of hard being recognized as um when you're in one position and then another and then our lead producer like his girlfriend was saida garrett so i could never really get any love on that end so <laughs> but that was like when i was like in my 20s and then um and then just over the years i guess they're just like relationships um, I, I, my sister is a publicist in, in the music business has been for years. I've met a lot of people through her, um, a guy, I, my first like big, like movie placement was, um, he was the, the soup over, uh, you know, on like Tyler Perry's and, and he really, he liked my music. So that was just because of a relationship. And then, you know, and then over the years, it's just been, I am not like I've been doing this for so many, I mean, I've been writing and singing for years, but on this end of things, just, um, just trying to create relationships with people. And like, um, the person I pitched to last week is a really good friend who's a supervisor. So it's, it's just been through relationships and just, you know, and, and, and it's been a, you know, good experience. Some things haven't been, but for the most part, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like a shoot for the stars kind of girl. So I'm right. just like, you know, if I don't ask what I'm not going right. to so. bet you was, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. I got you. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I really appreciate you sharing Dana. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> yeah, no. Cause this is really helpful. I think for, <clears throat> you know, our whole audience, as far as just, you know, hearing other people's stories and testimonials, you know, not just from us, you know, who have, you know, we speak all the time, but I know like there's, you know, we get an audience, you know, our members, our community, um, they're active as well. I know you all have stories. And so moving on to John, I know John personally, so I know he's pitching this stuff. John, what have, what have you found that's worked for you, you know, in pitching um, that you found? Hey guys, good to, good to be here and talk to all you guys. Um, I'm, I'm going back to one of my first pitches, which was about 10 or 12 years ago. And it was for, uh, actually for Marvel animation back at the time. And I didn't get the gig. But we went back and forth on a uh, a song that would have been would have been like the title track for uh, for a, a, an animated feature they were doing at the time. And despite the disappointment of that, uh, the the one thing that uh, the one piece of feedback that I got was he said it was a great track. Just we kind of you know it it just ended up you know the, the needs kind of morphed a little bit. But but he appreciated that we were really responsive. I mean, if he sent an email, I responded. Like within minutes, he didn't have to, you know, didn't have to wait around all day. Uh, so, so I mean, in addition, I agree with uh, you know being a being a great human, building relationships. But I I also found that like promptness and uh, just basic courtesy, you know, courtesy also means like uh, understanding the needs of of the soup and that you know they need something right away. And so I can't just say oh, I'm going to check my email tomorrow and see. I mean, so just that diligence of being attentive and being, uh, being very intentional as far as this is the, you know, the, the, the pitch was a big deal. And it was, I think that through our diligence and through at least our communication expressed to them that we did take it very seriously, even though we didn't get the gig. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that John. Like it is, I feel like even in those moments when they don't show up or, or it doesn't land in the way you had hoped, cause I've been like really, really close to some big stuff. Uh, but you know, it, it didn't fall through for one reason or, or the other, but that, again, I feel like this, the whole theme is going to be around relationships, like that relationship showing that you can show up and that you're trustworthy. Like, I think it just puts you in 
good standing. And also it kind of makes, you know, you know, those who are looking to license your music kind of push you in their favor. They want to kind of look out for you, even though it might not, you know, might've been so close to landing. They might want to say like, man, I really want to get, you know, they, you might come top of mind for the next one is what I'm saying. If you show up well, even if, you know, the first one doesn't land. So man, I love that, John. I appreciate it, man. Taraj, Thanks, you just highlighted something really important that John was saying, which is, you will almost always come top of mind next time. It doesn't actually matter if your song doesn't land in that show, or especially if you get that far down the line with a large movie like that, like John did. It is so many of our good gigs come from, you know, oh, hey, you know, I had one that came from two years ago. Someone was like, oh, you pitched this thing two years ago for this other production company and we loved it. We were working with them. Do you think you want to do a thing for this? You were so nice. And, and by the way, they didn't say your music was so great. They just went, you were so nice. <laughs> so right, I'm, a, right. I'm a big believer in that kind of stuff and retreading songs and all that kind of stuff. It all comes back around. So try to keep your head ab about that stuff. I totally agree. I just <clears throat> will quickly add, um, I think if you come from a place of not just looking to get a placement, but come from a place of service, like the person that you're doing business with needs something. And if you are, have any capacity or ability to help facilitate what they need, whether you immediately benefit from it or not. Um, I had somebody call me um, two weeks ago looking, you know, a supervisor on a big production, big movie, was looking to, um, to pull a band together in Atlanta. And I'm not currently in Atlanta. I'm in Greenville. And, um, um, but they will, needed somebody. They needed a real short turnaround. And um, I directed them to a producer that I've worked with there who I knew was tight with, you know, really good musicians and bands and everything. And I didn't have anything to do with it, but I knew that that would help what they needed. And they were really appreciative. And the person who I referred them to was really appreciative. And, you know, it's and for me, it's 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 about, you know, somebody comes to you with a problem. Can you help solve their problem? And if you can do that, then, you know. Then, then you're seen as somebody who's helpful, and uh, that's always a good thing. I love that. I love it. All right, so we have uh, two more, and then we're going to pivot to see who actually did the homework assignment from last week. Oh, we should do a poll to see who actually remembers what the homework assignment was. From last week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and I think, and I apologize. I think I skipped Janae. Uh, what's up, Janae? How are you? Hi, I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? Good. So I'm a, I, I, I think you're in the category of you've, you've pitched your music before, right? Yes, but in a more untraditional way than to okay. like a supervisor. I was actually a stand in on a feature film set. Um, and I had a conversation with the director. And after I left the set, I wrote a song and decided to like shoot my shot. Fire. <laughs> Sent it to the director she gave, after she gave me her contact info. Um, and I guess I kind of got lucky. <laughs> Uh, and a relationship kind of grew from there. So like everybody's been talking about relationships and I've been able to get more opportunities to potentially like work on more songs for that specific film, as well as her putting me in contact with her like director friends who are also working on projects that are interested in having my music in their film. So yeah, I guess like I just sh shot in the dark and crossed my fingers and I, good luck. <laughs> Don't yeah. belittle, don't belittle yeah. your work on that. You did not shoot a shot in the dark. That was a calculated shot that you were smart enough to take. You had good music. You were polite. You clearly made a relationship with the director enough for them to give you their phone number. And then you made a calculated shot. So don't diminish your work because it's not just luck. It's all of the product of all the things that we're talking about. Be a human. Be, you know, make relationships. Be respectful and do it in a way where people are willing to work with you. So congratulations. That's great. Don't diminish your work. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, she bodied that. She, I mean, she skipped a whole, a whole line and went straight to the director. So that's awesome. Janae. <laughs> <laughs> that was a cheat code right there. Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing that, Janae. And I, I'm glad you came up because, you know, there are those alternative ways, you know, to still get your music in front of, you know, the right people. And it may come in, you know, ways that you weren't necessarily anticipating, you know, as a stand in, you know, going for, you know, a particular role, you know, the opportunity came where, you know, I also have music, but, you know, you did it tactfully. So I love that. I appreciate it, Janae. Thank you. 
And then last but not least, we have, uh, she, she looks like she's brand new to, to Clubhouse. We can tell by the party icon. Uh, and I hope I don't pronounce the name wrong. Is it Tria or Treya? Uh, help me out. Oh, it's Tria. It's like Maria with a T. Oh, Taria. Taria. Okay. I was wrong both times. All right. Welcome, Taria. <laughs> Welcome. So, T Taria, uh, have you pitched your music before? <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> this information, God, it's, it's priceless. Um, this is an amazing room, so thank you for your time. Um, I did have an opportunity to pitch some music. Um, it was an advertising commercial. It was a relationship I had with a, a music exec, industry exec. And one thing I learned from that is the importance. This was like maybe two or three years ago, but maybe a little longer than that. But I learned the importance in um, time deadlines in the TV film world. I was coming from the pop, uh, hip-hop music side, so... <clears throat> the deadlines are a little more, you know, a little more loose there. And I didn't realize how strict they were in the TV film world. And he, I had written, um, it was a running advertisement, I guess, uh, you know, commercial about running. And I had actually written a song called Running. I had written it for a, a TV film, I mean, for a TV, um, no, a, film, a feature film that was being shot at my building and I just decided to write this song based off of what the guy had shared with me, uh, what the movie would be about and then a couple years later somebody reached out the and he was like, hey, you know, I have this advertisement, I need any records focus on running and I actually had a song called Running so he loved the song but I got it to him too late. He needed it uh, at midnight yeah. I got it to him by like 12.20 and uh uh, yeah, that's still eats me up a little bit. But. <laughs> that's the worst. I'm to the fact that he was like, I love this song. This song would have been it, but oh well. Right, <laughs> I just right. wanted to share that. I'm no, that's a, that. that's a really good story. I'm a, Eric, I see you flashing. Go ahead, man. Oh, oh, okay, okay, cool. No, that's actually a really good uh, a really good point, you know, as far as, you know, how quickly this side of the business really uh moves and understanding like everybody i got literally I'm, I'm reading this you know the um thinking in sync book and she says it a couple of times in there it's just like one if a music if it can't get all parties to clear it then that's one strike but also two it's just like if they can't find you know if it, if it doesn't arrive in a timely fashion or you know if they have it and it's not you know, they can't figure out who, you know, owns it or represent whatever, like whatever kind of becomes a barrier of entry. It's, you know, it's likely that they can, you know, they got to move on, you know what I mean? Just because it moves so quickly. But that's a, I think a really good um, point to bring up, even though um, it may not have went, but I guess the positive side of that story is that, uh, you know, the, uh, the individual that's looking to license the song, they actually really, really liked it. And so at least they know like, hey, she can deliver she has you know quality music that fits for the need and so i think that's a, a strong takeaway you, even if you know it, the deadline got missed but pretty cool pretty cool i have a question for jess grimulia based on that jess are you with us yes hello Italy. Italy. <laughs> i don't um, know why there's a flag on me but okay <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question, because I feel like you see a lot of volume in terms of pitching and stuff like that. Um, I'm curious if you're willing to share, have there been times where you've received music that you loved, but you can tell us why it didn't work out? Like one might've been timing. Are there other reasons why songs don't work out for you? And some of those reasons in Is terms of how people pitch. It, are they pitching because I sent a brief or are they blind pitching me? Let's go both. Why not? For a brief, if I love it and it doesn't work, it's usually out of my control. Um, and it's coming from the production team, like, or post supervisor, depending on the project, director, all that jazz, like you were talking about earlier. Um, if it's pitched to me without asking, I most likely haven't gotten to it yet. Or I'm just not looking for that. Um, like I, I've been recently getting a ton of Christmas pitches and I just, I don't do Christmas music. Um, I don't need it. I've never sent a brief in the three years I've been at Con and asked for it. Um, but I still get it anyway. So stuff, it's stuff like that. It's like, if I, 
if you know I've never asked for it historically uh, speaking, if you haven't done the research, most most of the time it's because um, I just don't use that kind of music. Um, and if I'm honest, I probably haven't gotten to it yet because I my workload is like unbearable, <laughs> if I'm honest. Uh, so I sadly don't get to listen to music um, for fun as much as I used to. Um, whereas I used to be a lot more proactive, so I could listen and spend more time listening to the pitches. I didn't, you know, that aren't just people sending me updates and new releases and all that. I'm, I'm not, um, up to speed as I used to be, and I don't have a coordinator to help and it sucks. Um, just like Atik was saying, I, I wish I would have an assistant. Um, and then sometimes it's just not quality. I'll get, I get a lot of pitches that aren't ready to be sent to a supervisor in my opinion. Um, and it's like hit or miss because I don't I don't ever feel feel comfortable giving feedback unless they ask for it. And even then, I always make a point to specify like, are you prepared for critical feedback, or you know, or do you want what you want? Do you want me to say what you're hoping I say, kind of a thing? Because that's a different conversation. Yeah, and that's incredibly generous of you because most music supervisors do not have the time, even if they want to, to give you feedback on why. Um, you know, a song didn't work out that way. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think something you said was very important, which is um, for our audience to take away, it's really good to validate your music with other people. You know, you said there's a quality level to what Condé Nast would say. And I would say, go listen to what, you know, go look at and listen to the content and the quality of the content that they're putting out, whoever you're trying to pitch to. And then validate your music with other people. You can validate it in our Saturday rooms. You can go to friends. You have other producers or songwriters or, you know, everybody's got a community, be it, you know, in person or digital or virtually here. Go validate that, you know, song and say, hey, how does this mix sound? Hey, you know, do you think, you know, this sounds a little bouncy? Do you think it would compete with voiceover or things like that? Um, so really listen to what you're trying to pitch for and know that quality because sometimes it can be an awesome song. It doesn't mean it's right for sync. Not every great song is, you know, meant to be up against a picture or in the background, especially. I have to say that's probably one of the hardest things for people to hear um, when they know that their music is really good. And then your only feedback is like, this isn't a syncable song. It's a great fucking song. I love it, but I can't put this to picture. Um, and then trying to go into why, depending on the project, that is probably harder to have that conversation than actually saying like the production isn't there. You know, this just doesn't sound like you have honed in your songwriting craft yet. And all of that is actually harder to tell someone with really good music. Their song just isn't syncable. <laughs> it's so hard. Hey, I love this. I want to get to, oh, sorry, Naraj. I, I, I want to get to say, Go oh, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. I was gonna say, just tell them to come to the listening sessions. We we get them straight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to get to Eric's question. Uh, you know, homework of the week. You know, from last week. But Jess, would you come back next week and be on stage again if you have the time? Because I'd love to get more into the what things might not make something syncable, even if it's a awesome song. Yeah, yeah. Let me know. Very cool. All right. We'll I mean, see you, you just Wednesday. let me know. Yes. I, I plan to be here on time today, too. It's in my You're calendar. Amazing. Jess calendar. is on another time zone, y'all. So, you know, we she's amazing for even being here. Um, so I'm going to beg you to come back next week because I think that's a really good topic. But I want Eric gave all of us and our audience some uh, homework last week. So, Duraj, you want to pull the audience and see who remembers their homework? Yeah. Or should we get I'm, into who did their homework? I'm, I'm filling these polls. All right. So if you were here last week, raise your hand if you remember what the actual homework assignment was. Okay. We got a couple of people. All right. I'm going to pull them up. Look, I'm going to actually, I don't know if I should do that because I don't know if they actually did right, it. Put, put, put your hand down. <laughs> put your hand down. All right. All right. Raise your hand if you actually did the homework. Hold on. We got to turn our hand raise it back on. All right. Raise your hand if you actually did the homework. Wait, can we remind them what it is? Maybe somebody did it, but just, well, they, they wouldn't have done it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The whole work was, Eric, you go ahead and tell them what the whole work was. So last week we were talking about business development, and I said um, I wanted everyone to make an effort to reach out to someone this week, make an introduction, someone you were in a relationship with, with a DM, a code email, using... The, the things we've learned or discussed in this room so that you're not doing it, you know, obnoxiously or rudely or in an ineffective way. 
And so, uh, yeah, we want to see who's who's done that or who 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 tried something this week. Anybody? Somebody somebody had their hand up. Who was it? Who who did the homework assignment? There he is. Okay, sure. I think I got the homework assignment. I received the homework assignment. And I'm yeah, sure same. And I definitely didn't answer. <laughs> so if you're in the room and you, I remember seeing something come in saying something about accountability with control camp nice. and i was groaning i didn't answer you yet i'm so sorry no that's a, that's a, but you were doing a, that was a real response so i think it's, that was the right way to do it just was like a real laboratory experiment you, you want you want a real life that's what's going to happen yeah, i got life. i got people hitting me up too that's what's up okay shireen is up here would you tell tell us tell us what you uh what did you do shireen i think Shereen, can you hear me? Hey guys, I'm on a walk, so sorry if there's background noise. Um, I reached out to a filmmaker directly who is involved with a couple of projects and just starting to think about the music. Um, and it was cool. It, it was cool. So what did you? Um, what was I the didn't. Context? Was it oh, email? Uh, I met her on Clubhouse. I hit her up on Instagram and, you know, did all the stuff we've talked about. And then she asked me to email her some sample tracks. Wait, so um, I, what, I, I, what I'm, it, I'm, I'm slowing yeah. you down because I want to know, was this the first yeah. time? Was this a totally cold contact or was it somebody that you knew? Uh, it was totally cold, except we met in Clubhouse and okay. kind of vibed on Clubhouse. So, what? Give us a general idea of the contact. I mean, the context of your your DM that you sent last week, or the first message that you sent. Well, she mentioned working on a couple of films, and um, one of them was about a a, a woman. And uh, so I was like, I have songs about women. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here have some. So it was, it was pretty loose, but um, yeah, that, that's it really. Very cool, Sherry. Awesome, awesome. Good, good on you for uh, for for making that effort, and thanks for sharing it. I think we should all give Sherry a, a, a mic flash applause just for for the effort. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you, no, thanks. Sheree. <laughs> Janae, did you raise your hand? Um, okay. You did something last week? Yeah. So I was in here last week, so I didn't know that was the homework, but I did it anyways just because, like, I'm a student and I've been, like, looking for internships, especially, like, August is coming up, so my schools are, like, emailing me. So I've been, like, reaching out to different companies and just, like, contacts that I've met also on Clubhouse to see if they would be interested in like having an intern or something like that. So I've been practicing using like correct email etiquette and just being a human being. Jan Janae, I'm gonna put myself on blast here. So Janae has been trying to get an internship with us for a couple of months and we weren't open again until the fall. And I have to give her a lot of credit. She's on with our team. And my team is constantly saying, she's so polite and she's so nice you better give her an internship <laughs> so, we haven't gotten to picking our fall interns yet and we weren't really sure if we were even going to get to with the pace of things that were going but you've been doing a great job and you know keep that up and sorry from our end but you know good good to be reminded you know again a lot of it has nothing to do with you personally um when you reach out to people and i think the way you're doing is right janae always reaches out very politely does, she's not annoying. She doesn't reach out every day. Once every couple of weeks or so, we get a nice little love tap from her just saying, hey, I'm starting school in the fall and we got to do some paperwork. Would you consider, you know, having me there? That's the right way to do it. Uh, and then, you know, as things get more uh, closer to the time, you know, then eventually someone like me or someone on my team will say, you know, hey, if we have a spot, you know, this is how we do it kind of a thing. So bravo to you. Janae. <laughs> Thank you. Clap it up, clap it up, clap it up. And if someone better and cooler than me wants to give Janae an amazing internship, do it because she's awesome. Please. That is so cool. Thank you, Janae. Uh, I do want, I want to just add to that for the room, um, especially now that I'm getting more and more messages from people and I find myself not always being as responsive as I'd like to be. Um, it just, it's a whole nother trick to manage. 
I really, you never, no one ever bothers me by coming back, you know, a couple of weeks later saying, hey, just touching base or just checking in or just, you know, as, lo you know, as, as long as it's not a, hey, why didn't you respond to my email type response? But for the people who are just like touching base, I don't think you will ever, you can never occasionally, in my opinion, follow up politely too much. You know, whether it's that okay, regular two week interval or once every four week interval, depending on who you're talking with. Don't ever say, oh, well, I've hit, I've hit them up three times. It's just not going to happen. There's nothing wrong with doing it, you know, four weeks, like just setting a reminder and, you know, two, three, four weeks later, just saying, hey, just checking in. Hope things are well. Just reminding, you know, just hope things are well. And then have the link to your music maybe in there or just saying I, I was following up because you had that request about, you know, Christmas music or what have you. But um, you, there's, you, you won't go wrong if, with a polite follow up, no matter even if it's multiple times. Eric, that's really important because I don't know if you remember our conversation from last week when we were talking about this. There was Hannah Goldberg, the student from the music industry student from Oneonta on the stage. And I was saying, I spoke to all you students and none of you reached out to me. It turns out Hannah wrote me a very nice letter that ended up in spam. And when she was in Clubhouse, I never knew she never got a response from me because her email actually just landed in spam. And when she was in Clubhouse, not only did she not act like a jerk and be like, yo, I wrote you. You never wrote me back, which I would have not responded politely to. <laughs> she was so graceful about it. And she was like, hey, I heard what you said tonight. I wanted to just follow up. And then what that what that did was actually kick up her email out of trash or out of spam into my inbox. And I saw the original message and I was like, whoa, like, I'm so sorry. So again, sometimes shit gets spam. So, you know, a little polite follow up can actually kick that out of the spam box and into somebody's inbox. And that's also why Eric just made the point. You never want to be rude anyway, but you extra don't know why that person didn't respond. They might not have ever seen that message. So true. So true. OK, so in the last 20 minutes we have again, uh, this is Control Camp. This is a we are a community of of sync licensing participants at all levels, novices to experts, supervisors, et cetera, all just kind of sharing and exchanging um, knowledge about music for TV, film and ads, et cetera. Uh, so thank you for being here. One question I want to have other mods who are uh, here. We're talking about business development and we always talk about business development from the uh, perspective of those aspiring to get in the industry but everybody on the stage has different roles and everybody on the stage i'm very curious you all do your own types of business development you all have to establish new relationships or you're cold contacting certain people or you're following up with relationships so i'd love to just kind of pull the stage in just in a couple of minutes just to see what do you do for your own business development are you active on any particular social networks do you use LinkedIn or DMing? Are you meeting people in person when you could do that? What's what's business development look like for you? Can we, Mike? So, are you still? Uh, are, you, are you here? Can we start with you. Yeah, I know you do I'm international here. stuff, so I would love to hear hear what you do. Yeah, so I take um, pretty, I guess, what most would consider a slow, slower approach, but one that um, tends to be stickier in the long run. You know, I think I've talked about on here before that these aren't just business relationships, you know, they can veer into friendships and personal relationships that because, you know, gaining trust from a supervisor or someone that needs to select music is, you know, a big leap. And in order to gain that trust, like, you know, you have to really spend some time establishing that trust and not just come in like hawking your wares, like, you know, what do you need? I got this, I got that. Like, you know, you have to really get to know the person and for them to get to know you and trust you and your musical taste and that you'll be on brief and all the rest of the things we talk about uh, on time, have your metadata in order, professional, et cetera. So um, with that said, in terms of actually connecting with um, supervisors and, and business development. Um, I always, and the reason it's slow is because I'm very patient about how I connect to them. And for the most part, it's 
a very, very, very strong referral. So if you think of it in terms of how we um, personally discover new music, most of the time it's through other friends uh, whose musical tastes we trust. And that's been established over years of knowing that person and getting good recommendations from them about music to check out and um, that you end up liking. So um, it's not too dissimilar when trying to connect with supervisors. You know, I know that they have a small circle of trust. Uh, and so when I was starting my business, I was the new guy and, um, you know, someone that people didn't really know or a name they didn't recognize. So the best way for me to sort of um, at least get on the radar initially and then from there have to sort of prove myself was to be patient and wait until uh, someone, whether it's a first degree or second degree connection, introduced me uh, to the said supervisor or ad agency or what, you know, um, or what have you. So um, it kind of went a little slower out of the gates. I m may have been a little bit more aggressive, but I found that by doing it that way, um, you know, getting that really strong referral from someone that they had already, you know, that was already in their uh, circle of trust um, just made the connection a bit stickier from the jump. And, you know, from there, it obviously it wasn't like they were just going to trust me out of the gates, but it got me past like, you know, um, you know, a few tiers of, of the trust sort of concentric circles, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, that was sort of my main, uh, uh that was my, my approach. Um, and, you know, sprinkle in going to events and, uh, you know, all the rest of it, uh, you know, where you'd run into someone, have a conversation and from there something can happen. It's not like I just sat on my hands, but I also just like made sure that if I didn't just happen to connect with someone at an event, um, that, you know, I was waiting and seeking out that first or second degree of separation that was within their trust circle and um, asking for a referral and, or an introduction. And that typically, you know, has seen that's, it's worked for me thus far. And, and, um, yeah, so, uh, that's how, I, how I got down. It also doesn't hurt to be as fucking cool as Mike, because who doesn't want to hang out with him? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the like, feeling listen is mutual to him stuff. speak, you're just like, okay, cool. I want to be your friend. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. Like, oh, thank you. No, it's, you know, look, I think uh, you made a really good point about these are not just business transactions. These people you spend a lot of time with, you know, if you're working on movies or long-term TV projects, especially like a teak flashing right now, it's like, um, you know, you could be a little different than Jess's job. You could be working with people on a movie for months. Like our post-production is going to be a year, you know, <laughs> like you're with these people all the time. And it's like, do you want to work with this person all the time? Is their music good, but they laugh like a hyena? I mean, I think about those things. I mean, it's, it's kind of like dating, you know? It's like, you're going to keep this person around long term? Okay, they're smoking hot, but they're dumb as shit. You know, like, whatever. The dating rules apply to sync, too. Uh, <laughs> we're getting real with 11 minutes left. That's crazy. As, as I was talking, I was like, this kind of sounds like Hinge or something. Or like, <laughs> where I'm like, I need the second or first degree of connection or something. But uh, anyway, right. yes, dating rules apply, I suppose. This is dope. I love that perspective. Um, Clint, are you on the stage? Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm here. What do you do? How do you give us? What do you do for business development for yourself? Yeah. So, um, I definitely I feel like the you know the reaching out and, and things like that you know it is it's kind of constant. I know lately I've been doing doing the same thing, but more so on kind of like a, a business to business or like brand level with you know just doing different brand deals and things like that and and leveraging you know the the following that I have. 
Um, and honestly, I find it's it's kind of it's been the it's been an easy transition because the same principles apply even from you know reaching out to music soups or music libraries. It's just like it's it's a different person in a company, but you're still treating them like humans and you know being polite and and courteous of of their time and and their busy schedules as well. Um, so definitely always doing that and um, you know just uh, creating music. I, I try and. I try and push off some of the other things that I'm not best best at to to my assistant or you know other people um, that can just do things quicker so that I can focus on what I do best, which is either creating content or creating uh, music, which honestly is content as well. Um, so I just try and you know stay focused on on the you know the things that kind of moves and, and pushes my business forward and and outsource everything else to kind of, you know, keep me most productive. Clint, you're not only um, a, a polite and lovely person, Clint's also a problem solver. And I can tell you when I reach it back out to person, so Clint, uh, we reached out to him for a gig. There were two opportunities and we gave people the option to do one or both. And Clint was like, no, I'll hit both and hit them great. And there are people that went, nah, I only got time for one. And then there's other people who went, you want me to do two? So it's kind of like in your attitude of how you handle things and you could bet your bottom dollar. I did not on the next one. I'm not going to call the guy who went, you want me to do two? I'm going to call Clint who went, I got you. I'll do both of them. Don't sweat it. <laughs> you know? So I think again, Thank you, Steph. yeah, that's, you know, and, and he, actually Koichi, we, it wasn't a wide brief. It was only a handful of people did it and Koichi actually won it. So it was like on the, on the team here, but what nice. you turned in was amazing and you know you'd be my first, your name came up for the next one so you know i think that goes back to being that problem solver and your approach to just how you did it too you're very polite and you're super fast and and also not lost on me for me i want to see people who are organized clint is hella organized and puts things right in box i don't have to explain things a hundred times if you're the kind of person where i have to re-explain basic stuff uh, look, I said stuff instead of shit. Ah, oh, I ruined it. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself for a second. If I have to tell you basic things over and over again about just how to deliver files, it's just time consuming for me. So you're not going to get the second phone call, even if you're awesome. So Clint gets that call again because he's diligent, he's fast, he handles the timelines, and then he does the extra credit homework when assigned. Hello, hello. Hi, Paige. Yeah, um, kind of a bit of everything within the company, like as as a company, and then aside from that, kind of as my own development, because we, it's it's kind of a specific job within trailers as its own. It's we're kind of a little subset of everything, um, but you know, always looking and into you know in show and all that. So it's a lot of kind of everything you said from, I mean, we're starting to have some meetings in person, but it's still a lot of kind of cold calling, some emailing, um, you know, responding to all the briefs that we can from mass email blast to just reaching out to our own contacts that we've, we've made throughout the years. Um, same thing goes was just for me personally doing that um and then through clubhouse i've been lucky enough to meet some producers and artists that i've been wanting to you know we've been wanting to make some artist albums and stuff uh more towards that and continuing to grow our expansive you know um kind of rolodex of of singers and songwriters and things for random projects that come along but it's, it's all of the above. I think you really have to, at least for me, I've really had to kind of use every avenue from 
from in person to emails to LinkedIn. We have, you know, Instagram. It's it's kind of everything. You gotta play the field and it's I think it's kind of figuring out what each company um you know pays attention to or how each company is posting and just know know what they do and you know don't go in if you're gonna cold email somebody you know don't go in just being like hey it's me and my stuff is great like you should you should know who you're talking to and kind of I try to push the conversation toward what other people do or who I'm reaching out to or what we might have in common because I want to find that common ground and kind of build that relationship more than you know I know that they're not going to always have a brief ready for me. So it's, it's more about building, building those relationships. And, you know, like everyone has said down the line, you never know, there might be something that you're perfect for that. They'll usually remember you if you've had a good relationship with them. Paige, I want to highlight something that you said that Mike also said that we kind of just glazed over for a second, which is validating your relationships, you know, so introducing yourself in a way that might be able to help the person on the other side know who you are or trust you quicker by way of saying, you know, and don't be braggadocious about it and don't be a jerk about it or a name dropper about it. And by all means, please, if you're going to, you know, reference somebody, make sure it's somebody that you actually know and that you actually have a relationship with. So don't lie ever. Um, But, you know, let's say I'm reaching out to Brian Miller at the NFL and I never knew him before. I might say, Oh, I'm on clubhouse, you know, with Atik all the time. And you know, this is what happens, but Atik and I have a a relationship and we were saying, blah, blah, blah. Maybe I never talked to him before and that's the way I do it. So then he can go to Atik and say, is Steph a jerk or do I like her? You know? And then Atik will be like, ah, she's kind of a jerk, but she makes good music. So I would not say that. Plus the thing is too, Steph, we actually met priorly. Before Clubhouse, too. We Remember did. at SyncCon? Yeah. At SyncCon, it's true. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making an anecdotal story for our audience. By the way, I also blew Atik off last night because I had to work, which sucked. <laughs> so Atik was totally grace, graceful yeah. about it. We had drinks, and like, that's the thing. It's like, you know, I'm so grateful that he is very uh, a wonderful human. And he is the one person I have to say. Normally, I have a very a huge policy against canceling meetings on people because people in LA make a lot of plans and cancel them, and it's so fucked up, and it's such a huge waste of people's time. So I, as a practice, never do it. But I really got in the weeds yesterday, and I had a dinner already planned, and I had plans with a teak on the way to my other, you know, kind of thing. And I was so working so hard and working so late that for my own mental health, I just went. I'm so sorry. Would you hate me if we did this next week? <laughs> you know, but it takes the one person because he's always talking about mental health. I felt safe to do it with. So I appreciate you for that. Yeah. No, I totally understand that. You know, like you got, I always tell people, you got to do what's best for you and your well being. And like, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're stressed out unnecessarily. You can always get drinks another time. You know, you got so generous and thoughtful. This has been awesome. This has been great. Um, I, I appreciate everyone on the stage for just what you've been sharing and the information you've been sharing. We've had just such, such cool discussions. Um, so, Duraj, Steph, any final thoughts before we transition into our um, after party? Duraj, you got some? Um, so, I just got a question in my, my inbox. I don't know if we want to hold it off for next time or what, what you're thinking. Ask it and then let's determine. <laughs> okay. Uh, somebody wants to know if there's an easy way to find briefs. Is it like a public place for music supervisors to send out briefs? Um, or do they already kind of have to be, or you have to kind of be on their radar already? Aha, uh-huh. that's an amazing Ooh. question. And I would say tune in next week for this <laughs> riveting response that our entire <laughs> audience is going to answer for you. I'll keep it in the it's, We're going to leave the on The question gets me heated, guys. That question gets me heated. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, I, I knew it would. Me too. I want to have a huge... Let's start next week with we'll this amazing with question. We got two great questions to talk about next week already. Let's talk about it. That's cool. Um, and I want to say, I love this new format. I hope everybody else does. And thank you to Mike and Amanda and Clint and Atik and Jess and Paige 
and my amazing co-host Eric and Diraj and to our audience who's very loyal and welcome to all the new faces that we see in um, Clubhouse tonight and, and Control Camp tonight, even new to Clubhouse. We are so thrilled that you're here and don't forget to ping a couple people and let them know this is how our community grows. And if you wanna build that network for yourself, add them to Clubhouse, add them to Control Camp. And you know, that's how we build our community. So thanks everybody. We'll see you at the after party. Awesome. awesome. Thanks Steph, Taraj, Eric. Thank you guys. Absolutely. Look at us. We start right at 10 Thanks guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Um, if you're not following us, follow, click on the icon so you can come see the after party. Click on the house so you can, and follow the club. We'll see the rest of you next week or we'll see you in the after party in two minutes. One minute, 30 seconds.